I've been preaching through the book of Galatians, and we're in chapter 3 today. Chapter 3 starts out with a statement that um, you might be surprised to find in the Bible. Paul says, you foolish Galatians. And then he starts talking to them about things they need to change. I, I suppose as members of the human race, we've all done some stupid things in our past that when we look back and, and consider them, we can't help but ask ourselves, what was I thinking? And of course, the answer is, I wasn't thinking. That's the problem. And that was the problem with these Christians in Galatia. They weren't thinking. I, I'm always uh, amused by stories in the news about uh, dumb criminals you seen those? Uh, America's dumbest criminals. I love those. Uh, <laughs> uh, Levi, Levi Reardon last year. He was wanted for theft and forgery. And when he, sh he saw his mugshot on uh, a Facebook, uh, um, America's most wanted, or most wanted in uh, Cascade County. And so he was looking, hey, that's me. That's, that's my mug. And he really liked it. And so he clicked the like button, which immediately informed the authorities of his location and shortly after he was arrested. People just, just want to let you know, internet, they call it the World Wide Web because pretty much everyone can see it, including the authorities, okay? John Morgan robbed a bank and he was so proud of his accomplishment that he decided to take pictures of himself and the loot that he stole. He was arrested shortly after he posted his pics on Facebook. <laughs> of course, not all stupid people are criminals. Um, a lot of different people get caught <laughs> doing stupid things. There's actually a website called the Darwin Awards. Have you heard of that? This is honoring those people who are doing their part to uh, reduce the stupidity in the human gene pool uh, through the process of uh, natural selection. Now, I'm not an electrician, but I'm guessing that's probably not the safest way to do electrical work. Am I right, Randy? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> he should, probably should have checked the ground before he sat down. Well, I, I've also had problems with machinery like this wood chipper. But I'm pretty sure there's a, a better way to clear that stubborn branch out of there than pushing it through with your foot. Uh, another Darwin Award winner. Well... Uh, you know, these are all people who uh, were caught doing stupid things. They're examples of, of what happens when we don't stop and think about what we're doing. If, if these people would have just taken a moment, stepped back, and looked at the situation carefully, evaluated what was going on and what they were thinking of doing, I'm sure they would have made better decisions. Well, I hope they would have made better decisions. And that's kind of what Paul is telling these Christians at Galatia. Stop, slow down, think about what you're doing. You're, you're rushing into something and you're not really thinking about what you're doing. So he says in Galatians 3.1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Uh, false teachers had come into these churches in Galatia and they had convinced the Christians that that faith in Christ was not enough to save them. Uh, these were Jews who wanted to impose the law of Moses on these Gentile Christians. And they said, oh, you got to become Jewish and you have to follow the laws of Moses. Otherwise, you're not saved. And so here in chapter 3, Paul showed them the difference between living by faith in Christ and living according to the law of Moses. He calls them foolish because they should have known better. 
Uh, Paul had established many of these churches. He converted many of these people. He shared with them the message of the gospel. He says the, uh, the message of the gospel, Jesus Christ being crucified, was clearly portrayed before your very eyes. They should have known. They had put their faith in Christ. They were baptized into Christ. They even experienced firsthand the blessings of living by faith in Christ. But somehow, somehow they were convinced that that was not enough, that they, they needed to live by the law of Moses. Now, we might read this passage and think, well, what does that have to do with us today? No one's trying to get me to live by the law of Moses. Well, there are groups out there who will try to get you to live by the law of Moses. And there are a lot of false ideas and philosophies and religions and systems of belief in the world today that people are trying to impose upon us, trying to trick us into believing, saying, no, faith in Christ, that's not enough. You've got to do this. But as Christians, we need to hold firmly to the gospel. We need to live by faith in Jesus Christ. And here in this chapter, in Galatians chapter 3, we see several blessings, several reasons why we need to live by faith in Christ. And the first one is that we receive the Holy Spirit by faith in Christ. He goes on in verses 2 through 3. He says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Think back. Think back about how you became a Christian and, and what took place. I just want to know this. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? Or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? The goal that he was talking about was, was sanctification, becoming more like Christ. Are, are you really going to become more like Christ by going back to the law of Moses? Instead of living by faith? We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by faith in Christ, and according to Acts 2.38, that takes place when we're baptized into Christ. The very first sermon ever preached in the church was, was on the day of Pentecost when Peter presented the gospel, clearly portrayed what Jesus did for them on the cross, and the, the crowd believed. They knew, yeah, this is true. He is the Messiah, and we crucified him. What are we going to do? Peter said, Repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off. As many as the Lord will call to himself. This promise of the Holy Spirit comes by putting our faith in Christ. And being baptized into Christ. And it's a, a promise that was given to all people, Jews and Gentiles. Paul goes on in, in verse 14, Galatians chapter 3. He says, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. See, we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we want to attain this goal of becoming more like Christ, sanctification, developing the character traits of Christ, we need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. The Holy Spirit comes in to our lives and, and he works on our hearts. He, he lives with us in this lifelong process of becoming more like Christ. Matter of fact, Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23 tells us what the main purpose of, of the Holy Spirit is in the Christian's life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You see, these are character traits. They're part of who we are and who we are becoming. They, they are values and virtues deep within us. And notice he says, against such things, there is no law. See, laws, laws cannot change who we are. They can change outward behavior. Our actions, we can have laws that tell us to do certain things and not do certain things, and that's good. We need that, but we need something more to change us, to change who we are inside, deep inside, and that's the role of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit helps us to change our, our sinful, selfish hearts to become more like the heart of Christ, and that happens by faith in Christ. We need 
to live by faith in Christ if we want to see that change within us. Why must we live by faith in Christ? Well, we are blessed with Abraham by faith in Christ. You see, Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, and many Jews claim that they're saved just simply because they're a descendant of Abraham. They took pride in that heritage. And throughout this chapter, Paul uses Abraham as an example from the Old Testament of a man who was saved by faith 430 years before the law of Moses came into existence. It's it's ironic that uh, the life of Abraham is recorded in the book of Genesis, the first book of the law of Moses. And so, so Paul pulls out Abraham as the primary example, the guy that all these Jews are proud of. And says, oh, really? You think you're going to be saved by keeping the law of Moses? Well, let's look at your hero, Abraham. Let's examine his life. And so he says in verses 6 through 9, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand, then, that those who believe are children of Abraham. The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. I love that that phrase, that statement. The Old Testament scriptures preach the gospel ahead of time. When it said, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. God made a covenant with Abraham. He promised Abraham that he would inherit the land of promise. He promised Abraham that he would be a father of a great nation. And he promised Abraham that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. That was proclaiming the gospel in advance. It was a prediction of the coming Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, who would bring salvation not just to the Jews, but to all people, to all nations. Paul points out that this Old Testament passage in the Law of Moses is actually proclaiming the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And this promise that God gave to Abraham was by grace through faith, not by the Law of Moses. The law of Moses didn't even exist yet. And so he says in verse 18, Galatians 3, 18, For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer, it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. This idea of promise requires us to trust God. When God makes a statement and says, I promise, that requires us to believe, to put our faith in that promise. It's not based on law, it's based on faith. The promise God made to Abraham, he also made to us through Jesus Christ. We can't receive the blessings of Abraham through keeping the law of Moses. The only way we receive these blessings is by faith in Christ. And Paul says this in Romans 4, 23 through 24, which is kind of like a parallel passage to Galatians chapter 3. He talks a lot about the faith of Abraham in, in that chapter. He says the words, it was credited to him, he's talking about Abraham, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, not for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. The blessings of Abraham come to us by faith in Christ. Why must we live by faith in Christ? Well, we're justified by faith in Christ. Now, Paul already talked about this in in the previous chapter, and I mentioned uh, this in my sermon last week, so I won't spend a lot of time on this point, but it is an important point. You may remember that justification, to be justified, is a legal term. It, it's like when the judge pounds his gavel and says, not guilty. It, it means that legally we have been declared righteous. And so we want God to be the judge and pound his gavel and say, not guilty. You are righteous by his authority. When he says that, we really are righteous. But how does that happen? Oh, 
Paul says in Galatians 3, 10 through 11, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. You see, the law requires us to obey every law. The law of Moses requires the, the person who is living by the law of Moses to, to keep it perfectly from the cradle to the grave. And if we break even just one commandment in the law of Moses, we're guilty of breaking the entire law. And no amount of good works, no amount of law keeping can erase that one infraction. We can't be justified by law keeping. I gave you the example last week of, of uh, speeding. If I, if I got pulled over by a police officer for speeding, there'd be no way I would be able to convince him to not give me a ticket by talking about all the times I didn't speed or all the times that I came to a complete stop at those stop signs. You know, don't, don't those erase my bad works? He'd say, no, of course not. <laughs> the ticket is for your speeding right now, and I'd have to pay it. Paul says in the previous chapter in Galatians 2, 15 through 16, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now, the commandments of the law of Moses were commandments God gave to the Jews living in that Old Testament period. But what about the commandments in the New Testament? I mean, if we're saved by grace through faith, doesn't that mean that we don't have to obey those either? Well, no. The commandments in the New Testament are given to Christians. And we have an obligation, regardless of the consequences, we always have an obligation to obey what God tells us to do. If God is speaking to us through the New Testament scriptures, we have an obligation to obey him, regardless of whether he forgives us. So um, we always have an obligation to obey God. But there's also this issue of understanding what faith really is. We're saved by grace through faith, and, and faith is more than just believing that God exists. It's also trust in action. It's not just belief in our head, but it's trust in action. There was a uh, famous tightrope walker back in the 1880s by the name of Charles Blondin, and he would stretch this cable out across the Niagara Falls, and he would walk that cable, and he'd do all kinds of tricks and juggle and, and just amaze the crowds with all the things he could do on this tightrope. He'd take a, a wheelbarrow full of bricks and go out there and stand on top of it and come back and empty it out and say, now who, who believes that I can take this wheelbarrow all the way across there with a living person inside? And everyone would raise their hand, yes, we believe you can do it, Charles Blondin, you can do it. Okay, who will, who will get into the wheelbarrow? Oh, all the hands went down. See, they believed in their head, but they didn't have the trust that would actually step into the wheelbarrow. Our faith in Christ needs to be that kind of faith, the faith that gets into the wheelbarrow. And that's the kind of faith that James was talking about in James chapter 2 when he, he talks about Abraham and the faith of Abraham. He says in verses 21 through 24, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Saving faith will always produce good works. Our good works do not earn us salvation, but they do provide the evidence of saving faith. Why must we believe in Christ? Why must we live by faith? Because we are children of God by faith in Christ. 
Paul is going to talk about this in much more detail in chapter 4, and, and so the sermon next week will really focus in on the blessings of being a child of God. But, but let's take a look at what he says here right at the end of chapter 3. He says in verses 26 through 27, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now this is our VIP for the week our verse in practice for the week. So I want to encourage you, uh, this is in your bulletins, in your sermon note, a little yellow box there with uh, Galatians 3, 26 through 27. Um, Take this home, read it at least once each day and pray about it. Pray, God, I, I know, I believe that I really am a child of God. Help me to live that out. Help me to clothe myself with Christ and really allow Christ to live in me. As Christians, we have a new identity and a new family. By faith, we've been adopted into the family of God. He is our Father, and we are His children. I love that song we sing. We're singing throughout the month of June, Good, Good Father. Uh, And in that one section, it says that we are loved by Him. That's who we are. Yes, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. But also, my identity is the fact that I'm a child of God and I'm loved by my Father in heaven. That's who I am. Have we really grasped that and and taken hold of that? Notice he describes that, that baptism here is not an act of the law. It's an act of faith. When we put our faith in Christ and are baptized into Christ... We clothe ourselves with Christ. We have a new identity. So now, whenever God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins. He doesn't see our past. He sees a child of his. He sees Jesus. And this is not just an outward change. It's not just a Jesus suit that covers us up. This is also an internal change. Jesus lives inside us and changes our heart through the Holy Spirit. Look what he says in chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Because you are sons of God, uh, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. And the Spirit calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. The word Abba here is an Aramaic word for, for father, but it really means daddy. It's It's a term of endearment used by children. It shows that because of our faith in Christ, we have a close relationship with God where we depend on Him and we cry out to Him. Whenever we are uh, in need of help, whenever we need to talk to our daddy, we can call out to our Father in heaven, Abba, Father, and we can know that He hears us, we can know that He loves us, we can know that He cares for us. And he wants us to just crawl up into into his lap and spend time with him and recognize that he loves us. The parallel passage for this is Romans 8, 15 through 16. There Paul says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again, leading to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, the law of Moses established a standard of righteousness that the Jews were required to live by, but they weren't able to live by. They were constantly falling short. You see, the law of Moses did not provide them with the Holy Spirit to live within them and help them to obey God. And since they were constantly falling short of God's law, they were constantly living in fear. They lived in slavery to their own sin, and they lived in fear of God's judgment. But as Christians, living by faith in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We are sons of God. We have Christ living within us. We have a new identity. We are children of God. We've been set free from the bondage of sin. And we are being conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit confirms with our spirit that we really are the children of God. As children of God, we have some amazing privileges, and we'll talk about those next week when we look at Galatians chapter 4. But being a child of God, 
is an amazing blessing that we have through faith in Christ. Paul called the Galatians foolish because they were giving that up. They were giving up living by faith and going to living by the law of Moses. Why would anyone give up all the blessings we have in Christ to live by the law of Moses? But somehow they fell for it. And many times Christians today fall for these false ideas, these uh, bad philosophies, these false religions, these uh, false teachings. We need to make sure as Christians that we are holding firm to the gospel of Jesus Christ and living by faith in Christ. I'd like to have the praise team come at this time and prepare to lead us in a closing song. And as they do that, uh, think about your relationship with, with God right now. Are you living by faith in Christ? Think about the, the, the blessings, the benefits of living by faith. We receive the Holy Spirit by faith in Christ. We are, we're blessed with Abraham because of our faith in Christ. We're justified because of our faith in Christ. And we are children of God because of our faith in Christ. I want to encourage you to remember our verse in practice this week and think about what it really means to live out this week as children of God, living by faith in Christ, clothing ourselves with Christ. And, and if you're not a Christian, you can clothe yourself with Christ today by putting your faith in Christ, turning away from your sins and being baptized into Christ. If you've never done that, you want to know more about that, I would encourage you to come and talk with me or one of the elders here. Let's be standing. We'll have a closing prayer, and then we'll sing one more song before we're dismissed. Let's pray. Almighty God, we're so thankful for all the blessings we have through faith in Christ. We're so thankful that, that you do give us your Holy Spirit and that, that we are justified. We're declared righteous. God, we're so thankful that, that we have these blessings of the promises you gave to Abraham. Uh, but most of all, God, we're just so thankful and, and joyful about the fact that we really are children of God. God, we remember that passage in, in 1 John 3 where it says that um, your love is lavished upon us by calling us children of God. And you don't just call us children of God. We really are your children through Christ. And God, I pray that you'd help us to live as your children even this week. May we bring a smile to your face. In Jesus' name, amen.